Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon but still wish to support us, please also consider checking out our PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. The link to both of those can also be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now, on to the next topic. Can you hear us okay? I can. Oh, we, perfect. Okay, cool. We can Turn hear up my speaker slightly. There we go. Okay, perfect. There we go. Awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, sorry about the little hiccup at the beginning there. I, I, I think you, Zach said it might have got just filtered out. I don't know why it didn't get to you, but anyway. Yeah, we got to it going. should have through my – I have a couple of other email accounts with high filters, but my Illinois one, it shouldn't have. But anyway. I'm, I must come across as spam. I don't know. Yeah, maybe yeah, maybe I could be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Came with a picture, right? Yeah. <laughs> so now you're up in, are you up in like in the Chicago area or where are you at right now? Yeah, so I, I actually retired from my faculty position at the University of Illinois. So I am living downtown Chicago. Nice. Okay. I, I have skyscrapers out my window here. Yeah. I was just actually in Chicago this last weekend. I was helping out uh, one of my, one of my employers with, uh, at the, um, College of Sports Nutrition conference there, and I uh, saw uh, Professor Stu Phillips for a bit. So um, I was talking with Stu about an hour ago, actually. Oh, cool! Yeah, <laughs> Stu, Stu Phillips and Doug Patton Jones and I are doing a uh, symposium at the ASN meeting coming up in June in in Baltimore, and we're actually going to do a man, uh, paper, uh, a review paper together on it. Interesting. Yeah, I cool. mean, we had. Uh, we had Stu Phillips on uh, about six months ago, a really good discussion. You know, we've had a couple, I don't know if you know Jose Antonio, he was on a couple yeah. weeks ago. You know, we were all these, you know, kind of pro protein, protein advocates for, 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 I guess, lack of a better term. But I've, I've, you know, I spoke with, you know, some of your former students, uh, Lane Norton and, and Gabrielle Leon, yeah. uh, you know, we both had, and they both spoke very highly of you. And I've read some of your work and it's a pleasure to have you on. Um, you know, as I, I talked to you in the email about a couple topics I wanted to get into, and, and one of them, um, well, first of all, just tell people your background because I don't, you know, there, there some people may not know what you do, and just kind of give us a quick rundown on what your background is and what, what you do, do for a living or did for a living, and, and then we can kind of go from there. It's, um, I'll go back a ways because it actually sort of helps paint the picture. I actually grew up on a farm in Illinois, so I have a lot of agriculture, food background from that standpoint. Uh, I did my first two degrees in chemistry, so basic science, and my PhD is in nutritional biochemistry. Uh, and then I was, and, and basically studied protein turnover, the, the regulations of protein, and, and uh, sort of got focused on muscle. Uh, first job was at the University of Illinois, and I stayed there for 30 plus years. <laughs> so, uh, I was a department head and associate dean of agriculture and uh, worked mostly on protein. Uh, we, my lab had a big role in discovering a lot of the work of branch chain amino acids and the stimulation of leucine on mTOR and the effect of meal distribution on muscle protein turnover. So we worked in that kind of area. So that's, that's, that's a good segue because mTOR these days is, is kind of, kind of paint it as a bad character and that we should uh, basically avoid stimulating mTOR at all costs because if we, if we dare do that, we're going to get cancer and AIDS prematurely. And I know there's, you know, there's some research out there that, you know, looks at, you know, uh, things like C. elegans and, and, and fruit flies and, and, and mice that seem to support that, that hypothesis. And then there's in my view, not much human data that really supports that. And, and I know you, you, there was a study that came out by Morgan Levine, and, and I think uh, Walter Longo co-authored that. Uh, it was entitled, I think it was, it was, it came out in Cell, and I think it was something along the lines of restriction of protein in middle age, 
uh, or excessive protein in middle age leads to cancer and, 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 and increased mortality or something along those lines. And yourself and, and Stu Phillips and another, uh, several other people's responded to that uh, with a criticism, which apparently was never published. But I, I'd like to you know, just kind of get your take on that study, your thoughts on mTOR leading to premature aging, cancer, and so on and so forth, and, and, and kind of go from there. Yeah, but, uh, let's start with a little of the mTOR question, then we'll get specifically to that paper, which is really an epidemiology paper and has lots of faults just being epidemiology. Uh, the mTOR question, mTOR is clearly a growth promoting factor. Uh, and, you know, without it, we don't grow. No cell can grow. Um, and so that also becomes true of a cancer cell. You know, so it, it, it relates to it. One of the things we know from nutrition, though, is by far and away the biggest nutritional factor for cancer is excess calories. And the second biggest factor is insulin. And so then we can go on down the line to other things. We know that calories and insulin both promote mTOR. And as you point, all of the mTOR data that really points to it being a problem are in animal species models. And those models are all chronically fed and chronically overfed. Mice and rats overeat by 40% if left to their own devices. If they, they do what is called ad libitum feeding, which means they graze constantly, kind of like most adults in the US. <laughs> uh, <laughs> unlike, unlike adults though, they, animals will actually get up in the middle of the night daytime, they'll get up in the middle of their sleep period and eat again. So they have stomach, their stomach is full of food 24 hours a day, which means they're chronically stimulating mTOR 24 hours a day. And therefore, it totally distorts the number. What we know from protein now is that what we want is meal distributions. We want pulsatile effects, which means you stimulate mTOR and let it come back to rest. There's no evidence in humans that basically that's a negative factor. And so the mTOR data, I think, is highly confused with too many calories, too much insulin, and rat mo and rodent models. And so as far as I'm concerned, there's no real data to prove that theory. It's purely a hypothetical theory that seems to work in animals who lived in sterilized cages and eat chron chronically around the clock. Um, back to that paper by Levine and Longo and group, as you pointed out, the, the title of that paper uh, says something about uh, protein uh, is a major cause of cancer. I think it specifically says low protein intake reduces uh, cancer risk or something like that. And you look into the abstract and they make some claims about protein stimulating cancers and increases mortality by 75% or, or some various things like that. But you actually start looking at the data and you go through their discussion and they very clearly state that there was no level of protein that was associated with any difference in all cause mortality, cancer mortality or cardiovascular mortality. So basically they dreamed up a message that they, wanted to hear, that they were biased about, uh, that they wanted to state, and it had nothing to do with their actual, um, with their actual findings. When we looked at it, people like Stu Phillips and, and uh, Rick Matz and, and Doug Patton Jones and others, we went back and started looking at the data. Basically, they did a whole lot of manipulation, which you know, I'm pretty negative about epidemiology in the first place in nutrition because it's the problem with it is you do a pretty crappy job of looking at food intake and then 10, 15, 20 years later, you claim some disease relates to it. And in the data they did, they went to the NHANES database, which is probably the best database we have because it has multiple food records. But what they did is they went into the database and first of all, they selected out only half the population. There's about 12,000 data records, people in NHANES, they use something like 6,000. So they selected out half the population for reasons they didn't admit to. And then within that, they only used one food frequency 
questionnaire. So there's multiple database days, days there with food intake to sort of average it out, but they ignored all of that. So you think, why did they do that? I mean, there's only three reasons. One is they don't know how to use NHANES. Two is they're too lazy to use the entire database. Or three, they didn't like the entire database, so they manipulated it to get the answer they wanted. You can decide which one you think is right. Uh, but from that, then they went in and they subdivided it even further and they picked protein categories. Um, I'm not sure if you know the, the, the Institute of Medicine's protein categories. They recommend a healthy diet should be somewhere between 10% and 35% of calories. Well, Longo and his group went in and they basically designated low protein as anything below 10% which is actually not a low protein, that's a deficient protein level. <laughs> and when they subdivided it that way, out of the 6,300 people in the diet, they got 400 plus, 450 or some number of people. So a really small amount. So you think about that, they're surveying these people and following them for 18 years. They did one diet study and on that day, they found they had a low in protein intake which corresponded to about 40 grams per day. I don't know of anybody who lives on 40 grams per day. In fact, you'd die if you lived on just 40 grams per day very long. So they found people who fit into that category and then they started making calculations. So basically the point is they manipulated the data and manipulated it and tortured it until they found the data set they wanted to use and then they made claims about it. And even with that, they got to the end and found no relationship to cancer. <laughs> they claimed it in the abstract, but you look into the data, and they actually found that the highest protein level resulted in a 10% reduction in cancer mortality. So they didn't even claim their own data. So uh, it was probably one of the worst papers ever to get into the literature that I've ever seen. And that's kind of why we wrote the editorial uh, turns out that Longo is on the editorial board of that journal, and interestingly enough, they refused to, to publish our, editor, our commentary. So uh, again, you can conclude what you want, but uh, it was really a lousy paper and should never have been published. Yeah, that's, uh, you're not pulling any punches on that there. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is, and I agree with you with the epidemiology stuff. I mean, you know, we, we, we've seen a study recently about eggs being bad for us. And, you know, again, it's one FFQ study done in 17 years, assuming no one changes their diet over a 17-year period. The same old, you know, it's the same old song and dance. I just wonder why we keep funding these studies. I just don't understand. It doesn't teach us anything. It's, it's, it's I don't know. I think, why, why the, I think one has to realize that there's a lot of motivation behind these kinds of messages. I mean, you think about the egg issue. I mean, for 50 years, we were told that cholesterol was bad for you. And who liked those messages? Big Pharma loved it. They could sell statins. We went from zero to 15 million people on statins now. Food companies loved it. They could sell cholesterol-free margarines full of trans fats. They could sell you Crisco. They could sell you all kinds of stuff as long as that theory was held true. It took us 50 years to, tell, to finally say, well, that epidemiology was misleading. It was totally fake news, and now we get some more studies about it. Obviously, people who are on that side of the ledger love that story. I want to go back to the mTOR because we had Professor, I don't know if you know Professor Ben Bickman. Uh, we had him on uh, a couple months ago. He's a researcher out at Salt Lake City, and he does a lot of metabolic research. And he said the same thing with regard to if you're worried about ins, you know, if you're worried about mTOR, then you really need to look at insulin as as one of the prime drivers. And and what we keep hearing about protein, but we don't really hear that insulin is actually more a more potent and then, as you pointed out, you know, a calorie surplus even even perhaps even more so. And so, um, I just, you know, I just wonder why we don't we don't discuss insulin very much. Uh, well, we don't discuss carbohydrates very much because it doesn't fit the uh, argument because carbohydrates all come from plants. And so you can't push your plant-based theory if you admit that carbohydrates are the primary issue. 
I mean, in the worst case scenario, Americans are eating maybe 90, 80 grams of protein per day on average, but they're eating well over 300 grams of carbohydrates. I mean, which one do you think is causing the problems? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't fit into that category, as you may or may not know. I, I probably. <laughs> sure. I mean, obviously, a lot of us are carbohydrate sensitive, but that's not the average American. The average American is eating well over 300 grams a day of carbohydrates. Yeah, no. I, I, Almost I, all of it's coming from refined forms. Yeah, undoubtedly. And when I see all this epidemiologic studies and they try to sort of pin these disease processes on meat, and I look at you know, the average American's intake of red meat is something like two and a half ounces a day, yeah. you know, in, 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 a, in their overall package, which is a, which is a tiny amount. And, and, and it has like, gone down by 30% since 1975. It has, we've continually reduced our intake of red meat for 40 years, and we haven't seen any change. We, we reduced our cholesterol intake from like 750 milligrams per day back in the mid-70s to about 280 milligrams per day, and it didn't change heart disease at all. And yet we've got, you know, we've gone from zero to 15 million people on statins. It didn't help. <laughs> yeah, I know it's, it's it, you know, it, that's an interesting topic. Let's talk about uh, a paper you wrote, I can't remember, it came out a year or two ago on uh, comparing, you know, let's, let's assume uh, we we decide we're gonna we're gonna all take up this plant based narrative and we're gonna switch the you know U.S. population over a plant based diet. I know you you worked on some calculations on what would that would mean nutritionally, uh, and can you kind of walk us through that a little bit because there's some very interesting conclusions you you came to. Yeah, I, you know, again, this sort of plant based theories out there, and one of the arguments people is, have decided to try and make is that somehow it's better for the planet, and one of the one of the target groups in agriculture has become cattle. So I wrote a paper, actually just barely a year ago, it was in Nutrition Today last August. And uh, basically it sort of looked at the overall balance of, of what should agriculture be doing to try and balance climate impact with diet quality. And one of the things that, you know, I've already said I'm a protein expert, one of the things concerns is, is that protein is one of the most difficult things to make in agriculture. It's very difficult to make high quality protein and enough of it. And livestock, animals in general, produce one third of the world's protein now. So if we start changing that, what are the ramifications of that going to be? And, you know, we start, we start down the, the road of climate change, and climate change is clearly a world wide issue. You have to think of it in a planet sense. But when you then think about changes, we have to think about those very locally. Because the issues in the United States for climate are vastly different than they are in China or Brazil or Indonesia or, or India, for example. I think it's important to recognize that on a world scale, that Southeast Asia quadrant, India, Vietnam, China, contains almost 50% of the world's people. The U.S. has, you know, 300 million. We produce about 15% of the world's global uh, greenhouse gas versus, you know, that part of the world. So if we wipe out every person and everything that we do in the United States, we have a relatively minor impact on the world's greenhouse gas emission. And so you start looking within that and you think about cattle, in the United States, about 80% of the greenhouse gas in the United States comes from fossil fuels, uh, transportation, uh, electricity, industry. Agriculture in total only produces about 9%. Of that, the majority comes from plant agriculture, and only about 3.6% actually comes from cattle and you know, dairy and beef. So if we think about wiping that out totally, we then have to put the protein and B12 and calories somewhere else. And so the estimates are we can maybe save one to one and a half percent of the greenhouse gas from the United States, which is only 15% of the world total. So it's an irrelevant number. And things like Meatless Monday and things like that, 
get down into the point decimal places, you know, like five decimal places out. So the, basically you have to look at the motivation behind who's fostering these kinds of arguments. One of the places there's a lot of stories right now is the uh, Guardian in England is publishing a lot of anti-animal stories. It turns out that HSUS, Humane Society for the U.S., has paid them about a million dollars. So this is supposedly a news outlet, but they're actually basically writing a sponsored series of articles about anti-animals. And so you really have to start digging a little deeper into these stories to realize animals really aren't the problem. It's fossil fuels, and it's the amount of people you know, driving their cars and leaving their computers on at night and all of these kinds of things are, are really where the U.S. needs to concentrate. Yeah, talk about, uh, because one of, cause I, read, I read that paper, and one of the conclusions you'd, you'd made was, you know, that, that we could, if we adopted a plant-based diet, we could perhaps produce more calories, but we would end up with a number of nutritional deficiencies. Can you clarify that a little more? Yeah, there was, there was a great uh, study done by a uh, research institute in Washington, D.C., and the name escapes me at the moment. But they, they looked at sort of the food policy, and what they found is that if you go through a lot of these scenarios, we already have plenty of calories in the world. We have enough calories available to support probably 10 billion people already. Uh, we lose a lot of food by spoilage and waste, but we have plenty. But what they said is if we start taking animals out of the diet, we're gonna risk nutrient insecurity. That animals, beef, dairy, chicken, pork, whatever, produce a lot of nutrient dense foods. They're high in protein, but calcium, vitamin D, B12, niacin, you kind of go down the list and animal foods are very dense, where grain foods are very undense. They have high calories, low nutrient density. And so if we shift toward those kinds of foods, basically we're shifting away from nutrient density. And we're gonna create a lot of risks for nutrient deficiencies around the world. And, and I think it's important to sort of think about who's gonna be affected. Is it gonna be the rich people who can afford to buy more food? Or is it gonna be the poor people can't afford it. The, the proposal isn't we're changing guidelines. The proposal is we're going to change agriculture. We're going to irreversibly change what food we produce. And so that's going to affect things like school lunch, nursing homes, uh, hospitals, WIC programs, SNAP programs, all of the people who are at most risk for nutrient deficiency around the world are going to be most impacted if we make those kinds of changes. Professor Lehman, along those lines, uh, one thing I'm always interested in, and uh, please correct me if I'm oversimplifying this, but when I look at some of the like nutrient absorption from animal-based products versus like a plant-based diet, uh, you can look at kind of what is contained in that food group, but then when you go another level in and look at how well that's actually absorbed by the human digestive tract, you notice there's a, a rather large difference between most animal products and most plant in terms of the absorption percentage that actually gets taken up. And to me, the just from like, to, in a common sense way of thinking is, well, clearly we're designed to be eating the things that we're going to absorb at the highest rate, because that's our body telling us, yeah, we're really good at using this source versus something that maybe a subpar that would maybe be like a last resort or a plan B sort of thing. Am I kind of oversimplifying things? Or is that generally kind of where, where your mind goes with that as well? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And there, there's a lot of interesting sort of anthropological arguments of how humans evolved to be able to have, you know, bigger brains and, and cover more distance and all of that. But your point about both digestion absorption and bioavailability are exactly on target. All of the vitamins and minerals that we get from consuming animal foods are all in very highly digestible forms and very bioavailability, bioavailable. If we take protein, for example, uh, proteins that are contained in plants at best are about 65% absorbed. So while the plant may have X amount of essential amino acids, you're only absorbing 65% of it. 
because you simply can't digest it. It's bound up to the fiber matrix. And that's true whether you're talking about B6 or whether you're talking about vitamin A or vitamin D they're all, or zinc, whatever. They're all bound to fibers. I mean, the, the idea, I mean, the plant doesn't have nutrients in it for our benefit. The plant has nutrients in it for the plant's benefit. So that means it's integrated into the structure of the plant. And the issue is we can't break that down. One of the one of the beauties of a ruminant animal like a cow or a beef animal or a sheep or a goat is they have a ruminant stomach that can actually break those fibers down and get the nutrients from it. Cattle are what we call an upcycler of nutrients. So they can take an extremely poor diet of grass and silage and, and even waste products from cotton milling and they can basically make high quality protein or milk out of it. So they're great upcyclers of poor quality diets to make human high quality diets. It, it, I think that's a very important, uh, and we've had a number of people uh, on, you know, uh, Professor Frank Mitlott or Peter Ballas said that they're in that space and we learn a lot from those guys, but this concept about upcycling is, is, is I think a very important concept. And can you give us a, like a numerical, uh, I've seen some data on that talking about, you know, you can, you know, the, the protein yeah. the cow takes in can convert it to X amount of beef. Can you give us an idea of the, 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 the scope? Yeah, the two, the two things to sort of keep in mind about a ruminant like, like a cow, either beef or dairy, is more than 85% of the food calories that they consume are calories that are not d digestible by humans. So they're basically taking grasses and hay and straw and making calories out of it. We can't use that. Of the protein that they get from those poor quality things, for every 60 grams of protein they get from plants, they can make 100 grams of high quality protein. So we're getting like a, almost a 50% increase in the quality of the food by allowing the animal to do that for us. There, recently, uh, FAO has, has come out with, or I don't know if they've come out with, they're going to adopt something, I think it's called the uh, Dietary Indispensable Amino Acid Score, uh, which even more favors animal over plant proteins with regard to uh, digestibility, absorbability, they're looking at ileal contents rather than fecal contents because of the microbiome changes that and so on and so forth. But can you talk about uh, some of the indispensable amino acids, things like leucine and some of those other ones which we see in higher concentrates in animal proteins and why, those, why that makes it different, why that's important, why we care about that stuff? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that you'll see if you go out and look at, you know, food products in grocery stores or Whole Food or whatever, you'll see a lot of the plant proteins will claim they contain all the essential amino acids. And that's probably true, but they contain them in the wrong amounts. And so we know that there are nine essential amino acids that we can't make in the body. So we have to get them in in sort of a daily amount, if not even meal by meal. And there are four of them that are particularly always at risk at plants. One called lysine, methionine, tryptophan, and leucine are always low in plants. And so you can kind of look at different plants and you'll see those different ratios. Um, we have to get them in the right amount. Leucine, for example, the body has learned to sort of sense leucine at a meal and it won't trigger protein synthesis without getting the right amount of leucine in. Uh, it's very hard to get in enough leucine from plant proteins unless you take some sort of a plant concentrate like an isolate or something. Um, it takes around three grams of leucine to stimulate muscle protein synthesis, which is very important as we get older, We're sort of post 40, as we have a tendency to begin the aging loss of muscle mass. Uh, work by Doug Patton Jones and I and, and other people have shown that you need a certain amount of leucine to stimulate that protein synthesis to be able to repair and replace your muscles as we need to. And it's just very hard to get that out of plant proteins. Uh, uh, lysine is another one. Lysine is deficient in almost all grain products. Tryptophan is typically low in all grain products. Methionine is low in all plant, in all uh, legumes. And so the problem is there's this mixture of plants that 
they're all low. And so if you're going to get along with a plant-based diet, you're going to have to eat a lot more calories and a lot more proteins to get an equal amount. So it just becomes very difficult to sustain a healthy diet if you only eat plant-based things. Yeah, what, you know, just, I mean, if we were to compare like uh, dairy or, you know, like a steak or something like that, you know, I don't know if you know the numbers off the top of your head, like to get the requisite three grams of leucine or the requisite amount of lysine and compared it to like, we often see these comparisons how, you know, broccoli has just as much protein as a steak does not, you know, and they don't talk about crude nitrogen versus, you know, the fact that we can't absorb 60% of it. And then we, and then we get into these leucine lysine type of things. What is, what does a real comparison look like when we talk about what we actually need, uh, you know, and the ratios we need them? Can we, is there any idea to figure out what the difference is? So you can go through and look at the lysine content, but then you also have to think about availability from plant sources. But um, we usually use it for the average American diet, we get about 30 grams a day of protein from plant-based foods, and we get about 70 grams, 60, 70 grams from animal-based foods. And so if you use that mix, you can usually say that uh, per total gram of protein, you get about 8% leucine. And so we always use a number of about 30 grams of protein for a meal. That will give you about 2.5 grams of leucine, which is sort of the minimum. That's kind of where the 30 gram sort of mixed, assuming a mixed diet. Whey protein, on the other hand, uh, has about 11% leucine in it. So you can get by with a whey protein shake at about 20 grams, and that will also give you 2.5 grams of leucine. If you do um, soy protein shake, you need at least 35, 36 grams to get the same amount of leucine. If you have wheat protein, you need over 40 grams to get to it. So you can, you know, you can sort of look at them as for as isolated proteins and make calculations. You mentioned diaz. Uh, the problem with that, though, is if you're using whole foods like tofu, now you have to assume that only two-thirds of it's absorbable. So now you've got another factor you have to plan into the, to the protein content. So legumes and things like that, um, you're going to get carbs at about a four to one ratio, four times as many carbs as protein. And of the protein that's there, only about two thirds of it's absorbable. So it becomes a pretty complex story to try and become purely plant based. Why is, uh, so the, the current RDA is 0 0.8 grams per kilogram on protein. What are your thoughts on that and, and its apl applicability for all people? Uh, and there's people that, that think it's too high. There's people out there that say, we, we need half that. What are your thoughts when, when you hear that sort of stuff? Well, first of all, I don't know uh, anybody who's a legitimate protein scientist who thinks it's too high. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so there are probably a lot of vegetarians who might argue that, but not people who actually study protein. Um, I think it's important to recognize what the definition of RDA is. Uh, we're pretty comfortable with it when we think about vitamin C, the RDA for vitamin C is 60 milligrams per day, and the purpose is to prevent, is to prevent scurvy, prevent a deficiency. RDAs are defined as the minimum amount to prevent a deficiency. We're perfectly comfortable with people taking vitamin C at a 250 gram supplement, milligram supplement or 500 or a gram per day because it might affect immunity or something. But when we get the protein, somehow we think the RDA is the maximum. It's still just the minimum. It's the minimum to prevent a detectable deficiency. And the range then goes up to something up around 2.5 grams per kg. So that's the optimal range from 0.8 to 2.5. And most of the research and all, both of the uh, last dietary guidelines and the USDA websites all indicate that protein intakes between 1.2 and 1.6 are the optimum numbers. So the idea of something of 0.8 or lower for adults is purely propagated by biased individuals, not by the science. Professor Lehman, what do you see, if anything, when people uh, 
branch out above that high end of the spectrum? Is there any kind of like uh, telltale signs that show up in most cases? There really isn't any negative effects of high protein if you adapt to it. So if you just take an individual who's eating 0.8 grams per kg and you put them on three grams per kg the next day, uh, they're going to have GI problems, they're going to be constipated, they're, they might even have higher blood nitrogen for a few days. So, But if you ramp them up over a one or two week period so their body adjusts to it and they build up the enzymes to handle it, there's no evidence for negative intakes way above, you know, three grams per kg or higher. There's no data to support any kind of negative uh, events. That's interesting. And then I'll, kind of along those lines too, uh, you know, I think when people think of protein, a lot of times they think of like it being a building block or like a muscle tissue uh, building block. And uh, sometimes that, like I wonder how limiting that is in terms of thinking about it. We just had a guest on the on the show, Sylvia, and she she was following a, like a plant based vegan diet for a while, and then had pretty low bone density, and then switched to a heavily meat uh, animal product based diet, and had a DEXA scan done. Like, and within four weeks, there was a noticeable increase in her bone density. Yeah. Is is the what role, if any, does protein play in like bone density? Um, so, so in the bone area, one of the things that is important to recognize is that bone is basically a protein matrix with minerals, calcium embedded on it. So you can't build bone by giving calcium. You have to build bone by giving protein. <laughs> it's the reason that, you know, people around the U S in general has a higher calcium intake than almost any place else in the world, and yet we have more osteoporosis. It's because of our lower exercise and lower protein intake in a lot of women. We know from bone fracture data, when you look at people who will injure something, uh, their ability to rebuild bone after a fracture is far higher, far better on a higher protein diet. So we know that bone, that protein helps that issue of remodeling and rebuilding bone. So that doesn't surprise me at all that her bone density went up. There was, for a long time, there was the belief that protein caused calcium loss uh, because you find higher calcium in the urine on higher protein diets. But what we find out is that protein causes higher calcium absorption in the gut. And so the loss in the urine just reflects that we're going from uh, absorption levels of around 20% in the gut to absorption levels up in the 40 and 50% range, which means we just have more that we also get rid of in the urine. So protein in general has been shown by numerous re researchers to be highly beneficial for bone health. Hey folks, Human Performance Outliers podcast is growing and due to the growth, we are looking to take on some new sponsors. So if you feel like your company or organization would be a good fit for our audience, please do not hesitate to reach out to hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, you know, because my background is in orthopedics. You know, I, I, I practiced an orthopedic surgeon for many years. And, and even in my textbooks, when I look back at that, you know, when we talk around fractures, you know, the, the, we have recommendations on increasing calcium level, calcium intakes. There's some indication about vitamin D, but we don't hear anything about protein. It's not really, you know, even in our, even in our literature. And, you know, it, it's crazy to think that our bones are, you know, a, a significant percentage of 40% at least are protein. And, yeah. you know, it's not even the structure. the structure of the basic bone is all protein. And then we embed minerals on it for strength, but it's a protein structure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's a collagen, you know, it's a collagen matrix and you add bone on yeah. it and you put the, the, the minerals that you mineralize that. But it's just, uh, you know, very interesting to, to, that that basic fact is not even in the medical literature for, for the people that actually use it day to day. And it's, it seems like it's so obvious. Um, what do you, so let's talk about um, the importance of lean muscle mass on the aging human being, you know, because uh, do you feel that, there, that that's important? There's people that think it doesn't matter. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I think, you know, I certainly subscribe to sort of a muscle-centric health. I think that muscle kind of 
handles everything, everything from insulin sensitivity to lipid metabolism, not only besides the issues of mobility and daily function and stuff. So, you know, I think both for uh, daily function, but also metabolic health, muscle sort of is the center of it. And we know that somewhere in our 40s, we sort of begin a downward slope on, on muscle health and bone health. And that what we want to do is try and do things that flatten that curve. We know we can't reverse it. We know that, you know, as we get older, we're going to have a downward slope. But what we want it to be is as flat as possible. And some great work by Doug Patton Jones is that not only is it a downward slope, but as we get older, somewhere in life, we're going to get ill. We're going to have an injury. We're going to have a surgery. And at those points, we have dramatic catabolic periods that are short periods. And how we recover from those is really critical. And the, the importance of protein and physical activity for that recovery process is critical, or we just sort of accelerate the downward slide. So aging is an issue we can't get away from, but what we want to do is try and modify it and blunt it for as long as we can. Let's talk a little bit about training and protein requirements and timing, because for many years, and, 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 I, and I've seen sort of con conflicting evidence on this, we were told that there is a window, an anabolic window after training that you have to, you know, rush in 30 grams of protein within 30 minutes of working out. And then that's been extended. And, and so what's the current thought on, on that particular aspect of, of trying to preserve or build muscle mass? Yeah. So, you know, I think, um, I think you quickly have to sort out sort of the, the, the person who exercises for general health versus the person who's trying to maximize mass and strength and you know some sort of an elite bodybuilder um the the average person who's sort of doing their regular routine uh isn't going to see much effect from having protein right after exercise we know from our research that if you go through an intense workout uh we did aerobic research uh in my lab aerobic exercise and a lot of people have done resistance we know that there's a rebuilding period that you go through. Part of the process of remodeling bone or muscle is you kind of go through a catabolic period and then a recovery period. And we found in our research that if you sort of do the exercise, uh, you will stay in that catabolic period longer until your next protein meal. And so that's sort of where that having protein right after exercise came from. Uh, the research now shows that it's most evident in people when they start training. So people who are well-trained don't go through as big of cycles. And the effect was most evident if you do it sort of close within the first two hours after exercise. If you take a person who's totally sedentary and you do exercise, you'll still see an effect 24 hours later, but that's a carryover effect of the exercise. So if you're looking to maximize the recovery, I think people still recognize that taking protein the first couple of hours after exercise is probably a good thing. Uh, in terms of benefit from it, I would say, frankly, for most people, it's pretty marginal. Having your main meals, uh, you know, three or four, whatever you choose, however you just choose to distribute your protein, I think, it, I think it's perfectly fine. Um, you know, I, I personally work out every day and I don't use protein after exercise and I basically discovered the effect. So I'm not too, I'm not, uh, particularly, um, uh, you know, for an average person at working out, I don't think there's much effect that you're going to see. If you're really trying to maximize your muscle building, then I think it would be a good idea. Do you feel that uh, when you early on the show, you, you said, uh, you know, the, the recommended healthy range for protein is 10 to 35 percent. I've heard people talk from different aspects from anthropology and on saying that, you know, the maximum, you know, safe range of human uh, protein has been around 35 percent. You know, we see we do see people that eat more than that. I mean, you know, we see it in, in, in elite level body where they'll eat 50, 60, even 70 percent of their protein in their diet. What is the harm in doing that and going to that high level, or is there any? I don't know of any 
real data to show that there's a negative effect. There's some animal data by Steve Simpson and other people who have shown some longevity effects in animals, but uh, rodents are sensitive to protein in ways humans aren't. Um, so I'm not sure how it extrapolates. Uh, I don't know that there's a very good data base to uh, sort of pull on uh, people who've been eating, say, 60% protein for a long period of time. I, I don't know where I would get that kind of data. Uh, you know, maybe with the carnivore diets and things, we'll have data like that in another 10, 15 years. But uh, I don't know of any data. I mean, there's, there's sort of historical data, you know, Lewis and Clark and things like that, of people who lived on high protein diets for long periods of time. But, uh, you know, people back in those days only lived to their mid 40s or 50s anyway. So, you know, for people that are trying to be healthy in their 90s, uh, we just don't really have any data for extremely high protein intakes for long periods of time. Yeah, just one point of clarification because I, you know, I'm somebody that eats a you know carnivore style diet, and and still I only get about 35 percent of my calories come from from protein anyway. So it's not a, it's still within that sort of normal healthy range. I think most people do it because what happens is, you know, long term chicken breast diet just isn't palatable, and you can't yeah. do it long. -term. No, I find again I'm a protein person, and I find sustaining. For me, sustaining 160 grams of protein per day is really a high level. I just, I just kind of get tired of it. But I think that there is huge benefit to getting to the 100 to 140 range for most people and distributing it at least three meals with at least 30 grams. I think there's huge benefits for adults for that. So people who are arguing like the uh, Longo data trying to argue for people consuming 40 grams a day, I mean, that's just out the lunch. I mean, we need to maintain protein intakes much higher than that for long-term health. What do you think about, is there any sex differences that we, we need to talk about as far as women, ma male protein requirements? Are they pretty much just across the board the same? As far as we can tell, they're pretty much the same. Uh, obviously, protein is based on lean body mass, it's based on weight, so most women are smaller than most men. <clears throat> One of the things that's interesting about the meal distribution, uh, we've looked at the, the effect of leucine on mTOR seems to relate to plasma changes. So you need about a two to threefold increase in the plasma and the blood level of leucine afterwards. And the blood volume between large people and small people isn't that different. And so uh, people will say, well, gee, I, I, th there's a woman who's only 90 pounds, so that means she only needs, you know, 50 grams, 45 grams of protein. Uh, I don't think that's true. I think she needs to maintain higher than that because she's got to be able to change her blood level of leucine. So, you know, I don't think it, I don't think weight uh, totally gives you the number. I think there's also a meal distribution that is important, and that's kind of the same across all body sizes, as far as we can tell. What are your thoughts around the difference in different types of athletes? You know, Zach is a is a guy who goes out and runs hundred mile races on the weekends, and I and I spend most of my time throwing heavy weights around. Um, what are your What are your thoughts on these two different types of athletes with regard to protein requirements? They both have requirements, um, but for somewhat different reasons. Uh, for the bodybuilder, that the muscle mass, the, the general recommendation is that it goes from about 1.4 up to 1.8 grams per kg, where for the endurance person, it's more like 1.2 to 1.6, so slightly lower. Um, for the endurance person, the aspect of remodeling and repairing is very important. Uh, you know, Zach would probably recognize that the wear and tear on your lower body is pretty high and you have to keep repairing that. You also burn branch chain amino acids at about 10 grams per hour during exercise. So you not only have to do the protein metabolism for the protein turnover, but you actually have to replace lost amino acids. In bodybuilding, on the other hand, you're trying to stimulate the anabolic process more. 
and you're trying to increase mass. And to actually increase mass, you have to have a positive calorie balance and a positive protein balance. So a little different reasons why, but both need more protein. Both kinds of exercise increase your protein needs. That's really interesting. And I know like for me, um, without having a, a background in like science and being a PhD or anything like that, I remember years ago, like looking at just some, some information and seeing like, you know, endurance athletes don't need as much protein. You can get away with less than a hundred grams. And I remember trying that for a few weeks and just feeling absolutely miserable. And, uh, I mean, some of it may be been because historically I've probably easily gotten 150 grams of protein per day. Um, you know, in the context of some pretty big training weeks, like sometimes I'll hit upwards to 20 hours a week worth of training being running and strength work and mobility type stuff. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think for me, when I go much below 150, uh, I mean, it's hard to, when I'm eating as much as I am, when I'm working out that much, I mean, you're just going to kind of get up that high just by eating <laughs> enough to sustain the, the exercise. But, um, you know, I feel way better when I'm well up above hundred. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that, you know, as you point out, the good news is most endurance athletes eat enough calories that they're pretty easy to get the amount of protein as long as you're not, you know, really trying to be totally vegan or something. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that people underestimate the wear and tear that endurance exercise has on the body. And I've consulted with a lot of endurance exercise and they all say kind of what you just said. They have a lot more energy, but they also have a lot more, fewer injuries. They recover from them quicker, and they're less likely to have those kinds of sort of debilitating, chronic kinds of injuries. So I think, I think proteins are really critical for any athlete. I think it's critical for any adult, any person, really. But I think both endurance and weightlifting athletes need it. Um, and again, the weightlifting athlete, the muscle building athletes trying to be in a positive balance. So they're kind of forcing the issue. They're kind of overdoing it, trying to get that extra 1%, 5%, whatever. Let me, uh, two, two, two quick questions. Um, you mentioned branched chain amino acids, and, and I know it was fashionable over, over the last few years to supplement branched chain amino acids. Do you have any comment on that practice? Is it, is it, is it, is it helpful? Is it a waste of time? Is there better ways to do that? Um, what we learned is that leucine and branched chain amino acids are critical for muscle sensing, muscle signaling, protein turnover. So it's critical to get to sort of that threshold, and I've sort of gone back and forth, two and a half to three grams, kind of just that range. Uh, we think two and a half is kind of the minimum to stimulate it, three kind of more optimally. Uh, uh, sort of lost my train of thought there. As far as supplementing it, if you have, if you're taking in a protein shake that has three grams of leucine in it, uh, taking in additional leucine is useless. Once you trigger the process, once you trigger mTOR, you can't trigger it again. You can't over-trigger it. Um, so, you know, if you're taking a meal, for example, you're on the run and you're having a lunch that only has 12 grams of protein in it, taking in a branched chain amino acid drink along with it would give you the protein effect. So you can, make, you can make 15 grams of protein look like 30 if you take in additional branched chain amino acids. Um, so that's kind of where I see it. I, I sometimes recommend that if I have a vegetarian friend, I say, well, maybe you should take in a branched chain amino acid supplement along with your diet. That will help you make it look like there's more protein there. But people who are taking in meals that have 40, 50 grams of, of, brand, of protein in it certainly don't need supplements of any time. I still actually use branched chain amino acid supplements after exercise. I said earlier that I don't take in protein. Take in protein. I just don't like the feeling of taking in protein in my stomach after I've had. I play competitive tennis, and the last thing I want is a protein shake after playing an hour and a half of tennis in the sun. But I do take in branched chain amino acids. I think they have some effect on protein recovery, but for me, they also reduce soreness. And I think branched chain amino acids have some ability to kind of minimize soreness type of thing. So I still use them for that purpose. I don't think the research is all that clear, but again, my personal testimony is I think it does help. 
Let me that's ask the place I take them. Let me ask you about, and, and we've kind of went over this a little bit with some of our other guests like Stu Phillips and, uh, you know, Jose Antonio, but when it comes to building muscle, you know, we talk about what are the essentials, you know, you know, and, I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, we've got to, we've got to simulate mTOR with appropriate amount of leucine. We've got to provide amino acids because muscles are going to be made out of amino acids. There is a, an amount of insulin that has to occur to, to be, to be, I guess Stuart Phillips said it was permissible and that amount of insulin doesn't have to be super high. It just has to be a sufficient amount and typically protein gets you there. And then right. you talk about beyond that, it becomes caloric surplus. And so you've got to get calories and then it, and some people will use carbohydrates to, to drive more calories. Some people might be able to do it fat. Some people maybe do it with extra protein. How, how does that work? And you, you know, because we often hear, and, and I've, I've heard you talk about, you know, carbohydrates have a role in performance. They have a role in recovery with glycogen restoration, which is, you know, I think the literature is pretty clear on that. But as far as when we say, I want to build muscle, you know, I want to, and I want to, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to drive protein synthesis and I want to minimize protein catabolism. What are the players that, that get us there? So, so as far as energy sources, I think there's a lot of data coming out that fat and carbohydrates are a lot alike in the sense of they both provide calories. Um, I think that for high intense exercise, carbohydrates do have a benefit uh, for you know, high VO2 max performance. Uh, again, like I said, I'm a competitive tennis player and I just don't feel like I have the same energy if I don't have some carbohydrates in my diet. So I'm not super low in carbs. Uh, I probably, I'm probably about in the 200 grams a day range. Um, there are people though that have done work with fat intake and far as endurance exercise, fat is a perfectly good fuel. Muscles like using fatty acids for long endurance. So, you know, if, I, if, if you're going out and running really long races where you're perfectly comfortable at 60% VO2 max, fat is probably as good if not better because you can carry more calories with less weight. So, you know, it kind of depends on the type of effort you're gonna do. If I'm trying to build muscle, actually anabolically build, the issue seems to be you need to be in positive calorie balance. And I'm not sure that there's really good data that fat or carbs, one or the other is better for that. I think probably most people would find to be in a positive calorie balance some some combination of those two is just more palatable to eat. <laughs> you know, trying to eat 300 kilocal 3,000 kilocalories a day where 2,000 of it's coming from fat doesn't sound very palatable to me. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting. We, uh, you may or may not be aware, but there's a fellow by the name of Stan Efferding. He's a, he's a bodybuilder, actually. He was, a, you know, the world's strongest bodybuilder type of thing. And he trains and, and provides a nutrition plan for a couple of the world's strongest man competitors. In fact, the guy that just won, Hathor Bjornsson, who's, you know, six foot nine, 450, 52 pounds or whatever he is, some giant guy. And, you know, he's, he's loading them up on lots and lots and lots of red meat, you know, to provide the, the protein, you know, and, and, you know, simulate mTOR. But he also finds that in, for, them, for those guys to get enough calories to drive that amount of mass, he has to do, and he typically feeds them a lot of rice and stuff like that. And yeah. so I think that, you know, that kind of makes sense from, a, you know, from what you're talking about with the research shows and what we're seeing in practical application. It's just that, you know, it's hard to eat, you know, nine pounds of steak where you might be able to eat five pounds. And so it's just, it's just one of those types of things. We kind of teach diet that way in the research lab and our weight loss lab. We kind of teach it that way. We, we teach to focus on protein get your protein, and don't worry about using low-fat sources. Use normal fat sources. Uh, we never suggest people use skim milk. We always want them to use at least 2%. We don't tell them to turn fat off. We, we want them to use normal kinds of fat, which are fat palatable, and then you bring in the calories with the carbohydrate target. Whatever your calorie target is, that's where you sort of titrate your, cal your carbohydrates to hit it. So that's kind of how we teach it, that you know we let – Protein drives the fat component, and carbohydrates hit the car calorie target.
And I would, I would imagine, you know, other than hitting your basic minimums for life, you know, with athletes, you're going to, you're going to do that different range, you know, 1.2 to 1.8 or something yeah. along that line. To, to... I mean, I was, you know, I was talking with Stu Phillips this morning, in fact, and, you know, I think we agree that, you know, I think there's pretty good data for these higher protein intakes, but when you start getting above 1.8, maybe 2.0, it's really hard to argue that there's any benefit from an anabolic standpoint, other than maybe just calories. You know, if that's one of the ways you want to get in more calories is eating more protein, okay. But to argue that there's a big benefit of eating 250 grams of protein per day versus 200 is really, there's no real science to argue that. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't doubt that's true. I mean, I, I'm somebody that's, you know, I'm a pretty big guy. I'm about 240, 250 pounds. And I routinely, you know, take in 300 grams of protein a day on, on an average day. And, and I do fine with that, you know, and, and I don't, I don't know. Again, I don't, I don't see any problem with it. Uh, but, you know, if you trade the calories out and you dropped it to 250, my guess is you'd maintain the same muscle mass. Yeah, you very well maybe could be true. And it's just a matter of what you want to get your calories from. And what exactly. You get- and I, like I said, I don't have any problem with the higher level, but it, it's hard. You can't make it a recommendation and say, well, 300 is clearly better than 200. <laughs> <laughs> sure. No, I, 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 think that's, I think that's very instructive. Um, let's talk about, uh, you know, because this always comes up and, I, and we, be, we just keep trying to beat the same message out there so people hear it. Uh, high protein diets are going to wreck my kidneys. Can you respond to that that statement? Yeah, there's been two or three meta analysis here in the last two years that have looked at that literature, and there's absolutely no data to back that up. So the the origin of that theory is that we know that when people have kidney failure, you have to reduce the amount of solutes, and whether that's sodium in the blood or whether that's nitrogen, they just can't eliminate it. So you have to reduce the amount. But the protein, when the Institute of Medicine actually looked at it in terms of aging and renal function, they actually found that higher protein diets actually make the kidney more efficient. And if you think about it, it's a little like thinking about you know, the, the heart. The argument would be that, well, exercise makes your heart work harder, so that must be bad for it, right? Well, protein makes your kidney get larger, and it makes it more efficient at clearance. It makes it work more, uh, and it makes it more efficient. Uh, All the indications are that shifting to a low-protein diet actually damages kidney function. And it's pretty clear in renal disease that if you have somebody who's beginning to have renal insufficiency and you go to a lower protein diet, their kidney will get smaller, their glomerular filtration rate will go down, and they're actually much less efficient at clearing waste products. So the, the data is absolutely clear that protein is actually a positive for renal function. And even though the medical school textbooks still talk about it, and doctors are still confused about it, uh, it's simply not true that protein causes renal problems. Yeah, that is, I mean, that is such an incredibly important point to say that low protein diets, in fact, exacerbate and make the kidneys worse off because there's so many people in the medical community that have no clue about that. And in fact, as I have seen lab results on people following high protein diets, whether it's carnivore or, you know, something similar, we're actually seeing people with chronic renal insufficiency improve their glomerular filtration rate when they eat more protein, which is exactly the opposite of what I was told in medical school and what I still hear being spotted by physicians today. So that's such a, I'm such, so glad you said that. It's such an important point. You, you can look into the literature now at all of these different diet, you know, higher protein diet studies and some that we published, glomerular filtration rate always goes up. It always gets higher with a higher protein diet. The kidney becomes more efficient. And if you look at nitrogen in the blood after a meal, it actually clears the nitrogen after a meal quicker on a high protein diet than it does on a lower protein diet. Yeah, that's, a, that's fascinating. Your point about the kidneys getting bigger, you know, we know in the literature, uh, when someone's had a nephrectomy, their other, other kidney will grow yeah. quite significantly to take up the load. And then also women become pregnant, their kidneys will actually grow to deal with the higher blood volume. And so it's, it's, if it's, you look, 
what my comment to Zach earlier about adapting to a higher protein diet, one of the one of those processes is that both the liver and the kidney will actually hypertrophy. They'll get a little larger with a higher protein diet. And that's part of adapting to using, you know, getting, handling the nitrogen, handling the protein. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, and that's interesting because we know that, uh, you know, some of the historical accounts on people like the Inuit who obviously ate a high protein diet had larger, had lar larger livers and larger kidneys. We know that, you know, back into evolutionary times, folks like the Neanderthal had a wider, broader based, uh, uh, you know, uh, thorax and, and abdominal cavity because they also had larger internal organs to deal with, you know, a higher protein diet, which is you know, just, a, just an adaptation of what you're doing. It's not pathological. I forget the actual numbers, but it's something like 40% of the size of the liver is the urea cycle. So as the urea cycle expands, the amount of enzymes, the protein expands, the liver gets bigger. <laughs> Talk to us about, um, a little bit about that urea cycle and, and, and the ammonia and, you know, deamination of the protein and the, the whether or not, because this is another thing that I think a lot of people have a misconception about, and we've talked about that with other guys, about gluconeogenesis being a demand rather than a supply driven process. You know, what happens when we eat excess protein? Uh, how does that work? Or at least in your, in, from your, your understanding. So, so if you look at the 20 amino acids and you think about, you know, every amino acid that comes into the body eventually has to get degraded and it produces a carbon skeleton. The majority of the amino acids, the carbon skeleton, ends up getting converted into glucose. It ends up getting converted into pyruvate. So it's part of the glucose cycle. Uh, and so the calculations that most people use is that for every gram of protein you eat, you'll get about six tenths of a gram of glucose out of it. The other four tenths are branch chain amino acids, so they get metabolized more like a fat. They're called ketogenic. And so the amino acid carbons all become calories sooner or later, and they track either through glucose or fatty acid metabolism. And so people are concerned about that. And you hear a lot of people on keto diets say, well, I can't eat much protein because it's going to produce too much carb. The, the issue with protein versus carbohydrate is that it happens very slowly. So when you eat a meal of carbohydrates, the body has to handle it in about two hours. That's kind of the definition of diabetes. If you're not back down to blood glucose level in two hours, then you're diagnosed as diabetic. Where in protein, after a meal, the amino acids will be higher in the blood for at least five or six hours. So you're metabolizing it very slowly and basically around the clock. We did a number of animal studies, and what we find is that muscle is actually taking up more glucose in the middle of the night on a high protein diet than it is on a low protein diet. <laughs> on a high protein diet, it's metabolizing these amino acids all night long. On a low protein diet, it has to turn to glycogen stores and you basically run out overnight. And so protein actually helps the body. I mean, the brain is an absolute user of glucose. You hear people talk about ketosis and ketones, but even with high ketones, the brain is still using glucose. The heart's using it, the kidney's using it. The body has an absolute need to have glucose around all the time. In fact, glucose is one of the most tightly controlled substances in the entire body. And so protein actually kind of buffers that and keeps it very steady around the clock. Yeah, that's, that's a very, uh, you know, I, I, I want to just make some comments on that because this is what um, you know, the point you're saying that if you're on a lower protein diet, your body's going to tap into its glycogen stores. And if you're on a higher protein diet, that may not be the case because that protein is slowly being metabolizing and maintaining that blood glucose. And so we're seeing two things on people that are adopting a high protein or a meat-based diet is one, their blue, their blood glucose is rock solid. I mean, it's steady. It doesn't change. It's very stable. And the other thing is from the performance standpoint you know, when we have people, I've seen a lot of people go from a ketogenic style diet to a higher protein animal based style diet, and they'll see an improvement in performance. And I suspect it might be that we're preserving our glycogen stores better. and We're seeing better capacity for recovery and, and performance, you know, without, you know, via, you know, retaining glycogen. Yeah. 
we did a couple of studies with animals where we could actually take out all the tissues and look at it. And we looked at a 30% protein diet versus a 15% carbohydrates adjusted, you know, with that. And we found that uh, on the higher protein diet, they maintained almost the same level of muscle glycogen. It was down maybe 10 or 15%. But after the overnight fast, the animals on the low protein, high carb would be down to 40% of normal glycogen stores, where the animals on the high protein still had 80, 90% glycogen. So basically, they weren't using any glycogen during the nighttime fast, where the animals that were addicted to the carbohydrates used it exclusively, and they were starving by morning and because they have to replace that blood glucose. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's truly interesting. And, it, and it, it lies at what I'm observing, you know, clinically or anecdotally in humans with the same sort of scenario. And I think that's, it explains a lot, you know, as far as, you know, what's going on with glycogen, how to restore it. And protein seems to be, you know, incredibly important, much more important than, than a lot of people give it credit for. Protein is far more metabolically active. Fat is the least metabolically active. Glucose is pretty metabolically demanding. Glucose, because glucose is actually very toxic, and the body has a lot of mechanisms to prevent it from being too high, diabetes and all the complications. And so uh, there's a lot of papers in the literature about glucose toxicity. Uh, the body never allows glucose to be that free. It phosphorylates it in the cells. Protein, on the other hand, is much more, uh, it's metabolized in a lot of different ways. I mean, there's 20 different amino acids, and each one's metabolized in a different way. So it kind of buffers it all out. And very, I mean, branch chain amino acids, for example, are metabolized primarily in muscle, to some extent fat. But when you metabolize it, for every nitrogen you take off a branch chain, it produces an alanine. And alanine goes directly back to the liver to make glucose. And so what branch chain amino acids do is allow you to recycle blood glucose very effectively. Yeah, that, that, again, that matches up to what we're seeing clinically. It's very fascinating. Um, what are your thoughts on, um, you know, uh, fasting, calorie restriction, um, you know, meal frequency as far as, is there any kind of optimal or is that, does that, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, there's a lot of research about, you know, intermittent fasting and, and that kind of thing. Um, I think the bottom line is it's definitely about calorie control. And some people find that skipping lunch or not eating breakfast or not eating one day a week or something allows them to control their calories. And most of the data now shows that you know, if you skip eating a day or if you condense your meal pattern, you don't make it up, you don't overeat the next day. So it is a net calorie loss. So some people find that effective. Um, I think that as we get older, those kinds of things become more detrimental. We know that bed rest or producing a catabolic peri uh, period is not easily recoverable as you get older. So while a 30-year-old might get along pretty well with that, I would never recommend that for a 70-year-old. So, you know, I think, it's, I think the bottom line is calorie control is a big issue, and there's different ways of doing that. Maybe eating a higher protein diet improves your appetite control. Maybe skipping breakfast. I am not a person who's hung up on a number of meals per day. If two meals per day uh, suit your lifestyle, I think that's fine. I think the first meal definitely needs to be high protein. If that first meal occurs at one in the afternoon, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> or if it occurs at seven in the morning. So I'm not, you know, four meals, three meals, two meals, I don't really care as long as you get calorie control out of it. Yeah, and I think that makes sense. And I think a lot of people find that, you know, a, like you said, a protein diet. I mean, there's some controversy about how satiating protein is relative to other macronutrients I've seen. Yes, it's more satiation. Maybe it's not. I mean, I, I don't know if there's any good. We can hang our hat on that other than just saying it's, it's hard to eat. It's hard to overeat a bunch of steak versus uh, donuts. I mean, you know. You know I, think, I think the problem with that 
appetite literature is that we're social eaters. We eat because the clock says it's time to eat, so we eat. Uh, you put food in front of people and they'll eat it. Um, I think that the, the data by Heather Leidy, for example, uh, I think the big effect of protein is it makes you less craving of carbohydrate and less likely to snack. So I'm not sure it's a, sec uh, it's a second meal effect as much as it may reduce the amount of snacking you do. And I think that's where people get into trouble. I think that people who are consuming too many calories are eating too many snacks. And I think that's one of the big problems with that epidemiology. When you go out and you do a food frequency survey and you say, uh, how many eggs did you eat yesterday? I'm sure you can give me the exact number because we eat them in little units. <laughs> you, how much meat did you eat? We buy meat by ounces. But if I say, how many potato chips did you have? Or how many crackers? Or, or how big was the banana? People don't have a clue how many carbohydrates, and they'll, un they'll underestimate. I mean, they, a serving's the bag, right? It doesn't matter how big it was. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I think the problem is we underestimate carbohydrate intake and epidemiology probably by half, where when we do protein intake, we pretty much get it right. And that's why the statistics will show things about protein and never show things about carbohydrate is because the food records are awful. Yeah, Professor Lehman, um, you know, besides the appetite side of things, like what type of usage do you see in terms of leveraging protein as a way of uh, taking advantage of just the body's extra calorie burn or thermogenic effect on protein versus something like carbohydrates and fat, which is when compared basically nothing in those two categories versus protein, which if I, if I remember right, I think is almost 30% of the intake. Um, yeah, you're a little high. It's more like it's more like 15% versus five for okay. carbon five. So it's a, it's a substantial difference, but um, you know, I think if you look at the data and we've published this, uh, if you look at the data as close as we can tell of people consuming a high protein diet or a low protein diet, they will end up having about an eight or nine percent difference in body fat or body weight, even though we think they're consuming the same calories, and I think that's a thermogenic effect. People have argued over the years what that's caused by, and the, the, the nutrition textbooks say, well, digestion, absorption, metabolism. We think, in fact, it's the anabolic effect in protein and muscle. We think that, in fact, that uh, a protein meal has a major effect on ATP use in skeletal muscle. And we think that that stimulation is where the thermogenic effect comes from. And we think that's why the, the meal amount of protein, what you want is three meals a day that give you that effect versus one meal, because you're now getting a thermogenic effect three times versus one. And uh, you know we have actually done that. Lane Norton in my lab, Gabe Wilson, we did that in an animal study, and we can show that the animals that are getting the protein distributed in meals actually will have less body fat, even eating the same calories. Yeah, I mean, it, it is pretty interesting. And I've seen, like I said, a number of studies on there showing that protein overfeeding does not usually result in body fat gain, which is, uh, you know, another reason to eat more protein in my view. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you start overeating protein, sort of forcing it, it definitely decreases your appetite. I mean, you're just not looking to eat more food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had, you know, it's kind of interesting. We had a, you might get a kick out of this. We had a guest on by the name of Molly Schuyler, and she's a competitive eater. And she's a female that weighs about 120 pounds, but she's put down 22 pounds of meat in one sitting, which I'm just baffled by. I, I couldn't wow. even fathom that. I'm, you know, I'm a big guy, and, I, and if I get, I can get maybe four pounds at one sitting, and then I'm done. But she, you oh, know, wow. so, I can't even, I can't even fathom that amount. <laughs> but I mean, it's you know, it's interesting because we look historically, we see these populations where like these Mongolians supposedly would eat ten pounds in a sitting, and a, a yeah. whole scoop within a day, and the Lewis and Clark expedition where they're eating nine pounds a day. Yeah. So this yeah. stuff is, is clearly has occurred, and there's people that can yeah. do that. And it's just I, I'm not nearly as big as you, and I'm a little older. But you know, I see I see a ten ounce steak, and I think, well, I don't know if I can eat that. <laughs> <laughs> that you know, that, that's a that's a that's a snack. You know, I, I look at that, I'm like, that's that's uh, 
Again, I'm a protein person, but there's a limit. <laughs> you got you got you got you got to step up your game a little bit. Yes. <laughs> what do you what do you okay, did you get a look at the Eat Lancet? Uh, were you aware of that dietary proposal to save the world? Did you, yeah. did you, ever I, you know, that? I haven't studied it. I heard Walt Willett make an early presentation and I've seen a few of the things and you know, I thought it was so ridiculous that I haven't actually wasted much time to study it. Um, you know, the, any diet to suggest you should have more sugar in your diet than protein just sort of blows me away. <laughs> and the idea that we're all going to increase our nut consumption by four, four times, I, I mean, the only place we get nuts right now is from California, and we've got plenty of those. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, I'm out here too. I'm probably one of them, but I mean, there's, uh, you know, we got the almond, the whole huge almond industry out here sucking down all the water. But yeah, uh, you know, almonds and, and pecans, over over 95 percent of the nuts produced in the United States come from the San Joaquin Valley, and the San Joaquin Valley uses over 50 percent of the water of all of California. I mean, there's no way we could increase nut consumption by a factor of four. There's no way to produce that amount. So you know, it's just kind of silly. Yeah, and I think the, the water argument is actually kind of an interesting one because a lot of times, going back to what we were talking about before, the cows and the ruminants get fingered with that where they say, well, it takes X amount of gallons of water to produce a pound of beef. And when you actually dig into that even further, I think it was Alan Saver was telling us, like, we should be thankful that these ruminants actually do trap that much water within them because what it ends up doing is creating a sink of this water that will just kind of slowly get trickled back out in the area where these ruminants are grazing, producing that, that better quality topsoil over time. And it's not going to just run off right away if it comes down all dumped at once. And totally true. And, and the other thing is that of that water calculation that these people are quoting, more than 50% of it is the rain that falls on the grasslands in Montana. It's not like this is going to help people in New York City. It's not like it's taking it away from people. It's the rainfall that grows the grass. So that is a totally misnomer that, you know, cattle are drinking all this water. It's basically they're eating the grass that the rain fell on. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the rain would fall regardless, you know, yeah, that is whether massive. the cattle ate it or not, it's still going to fall there and it's not usable to humans. <laughs> no, exactly right. That's, that's, that's so true. I mean, it's, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Well, I'll tell you, what, Professor, and this has been absolutely wonderful. I mean, just, I mean, it was just great knowledge. We, we, I, I learned quite a bit and I'm, I'm sure the people that are listening in are just going to love this. Um, let us know how people can follow what you're doing. I know you're getting a little more active on social media a little bit, which I think is a wonderful thing. And we're kind of, you know, just kind of getting more information out to folks. Where, what do you, what do you, you said you have some lectures coming up or you're going to be speaking some places. Tell us a little bit about what you've got coming up. Um, yeah. So they can certainly follow me on Twitter. So it's at Don Lehman. So uh, I don't tweet a lot and I, I, I never talk about, you know, where I ate last. I only talk science. So <laughs> you can follow me. I, I won't, I won't overburden your Twitter account. Um, actually this Friday, I will be in the Boston area. I'm doing the state dietetics convention uh, in Norwood, uh, Massachusetts on Friday, talking really about sustainable food systems and protein. Uh, then the next one, I believe, is early June. I'm at the American uh, Society of Nutrition meeting, and Stu Phillips, Doug Patton Jones, and I are doing a uh, symposium on um, higher protein needs for adults and catabolic conditions. So we're looking at aging and bed rest and, and diabetes and obesity and conditions where uh, adults really need to get well above the RDA to maintain muscle health. Let me, let me just, let me just coming up. I want to just, cause I, that, that brings up an interesting question because you, you put diabetes in there. Some people that need higher protein. And I think that's something that may, maybe you can elaborate on that. I know it's, we just kind of talk, but that's such an interesting concept. Yeah. You know, diabetes and obesity. I mean, clearly diabetes, one of the primary indicators is body weight. So we know higher protein diets, lower carbohydrate diets, um, are beneficial for weight maintenance and maintaining lean body mass. So I look at diabetes and protein and I think of direct and indirect effects. So as we've already talked about, direct effects 
it makes muscle more active. It makes insulin sensitive. Insulin resistance begins with muscle. So if your muscles are more active and more metabolically active, your insulin's more sensitive. We talked about thermogenesis. Higher protein stimulates energy expenditure. We talked about appetite regulation. It stimulates PPY and GLP-1 and, and appetite sensitivity. So those are direct effects. Indirect effects is it allows you to lower carbohydrates. We know that excess carbohydrates are a major problem in type 2 diabetes because you're insulin insensitive, uh, leads to fatty liver disease, et cetera, uh, high triglycerides, whatever. So we know that there's the indirect effect of trading out carbohydrates with protein. So in diabetes, uh, there's both indirect and direct effects, which I think make protein very important to diabetic diabetes control. Yeah, perfect. That's wonderful. Because I hear a lot of people that are scared to eat protein on diabetes because they're worried it's going to raise your blood sugar for the same reasons we kind of alluded to earlier. And, and that doesn't. If you, doesn't look, at, if you look at trading out gram for gram, uh, you know, for a gram of protein, a gram of carbohydrate, you'll have one third the effect on insulin with protein. And the other thing about protein is protein only gives you a phase one effect. In, so it releases pre-existing insulin or carbohydrate gives you phase one, phase two. So it actually stimulates more insulin production. So carbohydrates are far more dangerous to insulin than protein is. Yeah, that's wonderful. What <laughs> <laughs> I got my dog barking in the background right now. But what, so what? And, and and so besides that, meeting anything else that we can we can find you at? Did I say something that bothered the dog? <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned protein in the gap. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Needs a steak here. Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, I, mean, I think we've covered a lot of topics and a lot of different ones. So it was it was great fun and great uh, pleasure to meet both of you. Awesome. Yeah, you as well. And if you ever have anything new uh, and exciting that you'd like to share, just let us know. We'd be happy to have you back on and spread it to as many people as possible. Great. I'll take, take you up on that invitation. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people are going to get a lot of education out of this particular episode. And I suspect we'll, we'll maybe maybe six months from now, we'll, we'll, we'll have round two and, and learn some more from you. Because I think, you know, I suspect you, I, I already have a feeling there's a lot more you can teach us. So thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Lamb, for coming on. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.